Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim from San Jose Bible Baptist Church. So let's resume our studies on Revelation 14. And before I continue, I want to apologize to the onliners where they watched yesterday's sermon that I preached. I appreciate the encouraging comments concerning about the sermon about washing your hands for more than 20 seconds uh, in a spiritual sense. So I appreciate that. But I do want to apologize for where they mention on the lower hand, right hand corner about the computer logo with the background. I had to rush in finding a virtual, nice virtual background for my preach. And so because of that, and I had to try to upload it for you guys where I gave a promise about 7 p.m. Wednesday service. So because this was all in a rush, I thought it was all good, but then I didn't notice that uh, sneaky little logo at the lower right-hand corner. So please uh, accept my apologies, and uh, I hope that you nevertheless was listening to the Word of God more and got a blessing out of that one more than the background. Amen? That's what it's all about. Background is just something addition over there. The Word of God is much more important. But anyways, let's return to our main text at Revelation 14. And thank you so much for praying for me. I feel a lot better. I believe I should be able to be 100% power at Sunday. And Sunday service schedule will not change. 11 a.m. Sunday will be having service. And then 12.30 p.m. should be Bible study. Unless something happens to my health, but we'll see. Okay, anyways, returning to our text. We're now at Revelation 14, verse 7. So you'll notice over here that it says, here is the patience of the saints. So here is describing everything over in the previous verses. See that? It talked about uh, not defiling with women, whether physically or in a spiritual sense, meaning without corruption. No guile, verse 5. Verse 6, the everlasting gospel being preached, which is what? Verse 7, fear God and worshiping him. And then verse 9 and 10, they're to resist the mark of the beast. So all of this is summing up Matthew 24 about enduring to the end to be saved. So that matches up. Here is the what? Patience. See, enduring to the end. Of the saints, the saints who endured through all of this, following all the conditions based off verses 1 through 11. When they do that, look at this. If that's the patience of the saints, colon, here are they that keep the commandments of God. So resisting the mark of the Antichrist at verse 11 and the everlasting gospel at the previous verses it's described as what? Keeping God's commandments. They're doing works for salvation. This is not faith alone. It's works and the faith of Jesus. So they're having faith in Jesus Christ while doing works. So again, clearly, tribulation salvation is distinguished from church age salvation. Verse 13 and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, So some voice from heaven is speaking to John. Write. So John is writing in the book of Revelation. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. So God's saying blessed, blessed are those who die, who are martyred for the Lord. That's why when they are the dead, the Lord's going to give them a blessing. Why? It says, from henceforth. Why? From here on, this point on verse 13, Revelation 14, 13, and onward, the dead are going to be blessed because here's the blessing, colon, yea, saith the Spirit. So yea, meaning truly or yes, says the Spirit, the Holy Ghost speaking, that they may rest from their labors. Because remember, they were working this whole time. Verse 12, so now they're resting from their labors that they endured, and their works do follow them. Their works are going to follow them. So their works are going to be following them. Why? Because 
as proof to God Almighty for what they did in their labors. And because of that, they're going to receive a blessing. Now that sounds very similar to the judgment in which Christians, when their works are judged by God, they receive a blessing. So that sounds very similar to the Christian's judgment. However, the tribulation saint's judgment is very different over here. Because, as I mentioned at Revelation chapter 11, we'll rewind real briefly over here, the judgment for tribulation saints does not occur until the great white throne judgment. And the great white throne judgment occurs after the millennium. And we're going to see a little bit more about the great white throne judgment later on. But in Revelation chapter 11, notice that in verse 18, the nations, they're already judged. God uh, wiped out the nations at Revelation 20, which is after the millennium. And then he's giving reward to what? He's giving reward to the Old Testament, to the tribulation saints, and to those who live during the millennium. So, notice over here, this is referring to the great white throne judgment that's occurring. All right, so you just have to compare Revelation 20, and we'll look over there later on in our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. But let's return to our main text. So, their works are going to follow them, and then the Lord is going to judge them after the millennium where they receive their rewards. So we can see over here that the Old Testament saints then and the tribulation saints and the millennial saints, their reward system based on their works will be revealed at the great white throne judgment. Now beforehand then, if they're living during the millennium, it will either be that their reign on the earth during the millennial time would be based on their works. But what seems highly more likely is that because they are tribulation saints, because they are Old Testament saints, that because of their works that they did with their faith for their salvation, works and faith, then that means that because of that salvation, they qualify for the millennial reign. I mean, um, let's look at Revelation 20 real quickly over here. Notice at Revelation 20, every single tribulation saint is automatically qualified to get inside the millennial kingdom. So notice over here at verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped his beast, uh, the beast, neither his image, neither hurt. <clears throat> Excuse me. Neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. So this does not only include those who are martyred for Jesus, but those who did not worship the Antichrist. If they didn't worship him, notice automatically qualifies, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. See that? So it shows right over here that already, if they're a tribulation saint, then they automatically qualify. The works that they did, their reward system will be based on that after the great white throne judgment, during eternity, during eternity. Okay, so there's some weird teaching going around that hates dispensational salvation, meaning that there is undoubtedly different salvation plans during different dispensations. So the tribulation salvation we already seen is much different from Christian salvation, which is based on faith on Jesus Christ's work without any of our own works involved. So we can see over here that concerning about the tribulation salvation, that it is very different, but people deny that. So what they like to do is that they try to use Matthew 25. So we'll go over here at Matthew chapter 25. So here's a weird teaching that you're going to hear. Matthew 25, this is utmost proof that salvation is much different. Because you'll notice over here that people go to hell 
if they don't feed the poor, if they don't minister to the people during the tribulation. So notice over here that Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Based on what? Notice at verse 42, 43, they weren't feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, and not visiting the people in prison. Why, in the tribulation, isn't that what's going to happen to people if they don't receive the mark of the beast? They're either going to be in prison for their faith, or they're going to be starving to death without the mark. Because they don't have the money access to buy the food anymore. Verse 44, when did they uh, fail in doing that? Verse 45, they failed to do it to the least of the brethren at verse 45. So, uh, verse 40, because they did to the uh, least of the brethren, in verse 37 through 39, feeding the poor and then visiting the sick in prison. That's why God says at verse 34, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So notice this is a worldly kingdom, an earthly kingdom. So that's the millennium. And these people get to reign in it. Why? Based on their works. Now, some people who hate dispensational salvations, there's no way to go around this. So the only way they go around this is by saying, well, it's talking about inheriting the kingdom. So in other words, it's not based on uh, their salvation of going to heaven or entering the millennium. It's more so of like reigning in the millennial kingdom. Well, wait a minute. Over here, the idea is this, is that you go to hell if you fail in doing this at verse 46. Not only verse 46, look, verse 41 that I read to you. You go to hell. So that is salvation. That is going to heaven or to hell. And that includes the millennial reign. So the millennial reign over here at verse 34, it's automatically given to these people. Why? Based on, see, what they did in their works for salvation. How about that? Well, what about their level of works that determine their reward system? You're skipping that, aren't you? No, I mentioned it. That's why it makes so much sense, which I mentioned already. Revelation 14 in that commentary, and we compared it with Revelation 11, that their reward is based on the great white throne judgment, which is after the millennial reign. Right over here, Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. See that? So that's where they get their reward system, depending on the level of their works. But concerning where they did works for salvation, doesn't matter about the level, they're automatically given the millennium, uh, salvation up in heaven. Okay, so I hope that uh, you learned something here concerning dispensationalism. A lot of people, they deny works for salvation during the tribulation, but then the easy answer that is used to debunk it is verses 10 and verse 11. Those who reject the mark of the beast resist the mark of the beast. Now, look, if you're resisting persecution, not denying the name of Jesus Christ, that is a lot of work. That's common sense. How many saved by faith Christians today are denying Jesus? I mean, there are so many people who, if they were, if you were to be tortured right now, okay, and then mercilessly, and then if there was a saved Christian in there who was tortured for the name of Jesus and then under relentless persecution finally said, okay, I deny him, I deny him, then is that person going to burn in hell? Did that person lose his or her salvation? Obviously not today. But in the tribulation, you can lose your salvation if you do deny and cannot resist the Antichrist mark. You can lose your salvation. So that it requires a lot of work for salvation then. 
But people, they like to give this weird argument, which is Calvinist, basically saying that, well, the Lord will protect his elect, so they're not going to receive the mark of the beast. Well, what in the world, man? What is that supposed to mean? Where did they get that weird interpretation from? That is Calvinist in teaching. The Bible told you that if you resist the mark of the beast at verse 10 and 11, verse 12 is what? That's the patience of what? Of the saints. That's not God's election. That's patience of the saints. That's the work of the saints. That's not the almighty sovereign work of God. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is considered faith and works, resisting the mark of the beast. This is not faith alone, and somehow God sovereignly, uh, he does this protection upon you, where it's perseverance of the saints based on the tulip of Calvinism, where if you are truly where if you are truly one of God's elect, then he's going to sovereignly prevent you uh, from falling into sin, etc. That is Calvinistic heresy. That is not scriptural truth. Scriptural truth. People do not read the scriptures when they need to read the scriptures for themselves. They need to do that. They need to do that. Otherwise, they're going to deceive themselves into such lies and wrong doctrine. So, it is very plain about dispensational salvations. People who deny dispensational salvation, they're rejecting a huge, significant truth throughout the entire book of Revelation. Now, throughout the entire book of Revelation, on eschatology, eschatology meaning the study of end times, we see one of the ingrained doctrines in the book of Revelation. If you want to understand one of the most important books in the Bible, one of the salient doctrines that cannot be denied throughout the entire book, which we've studied so many times, is a tribulation salvation, which is different from Christian salvation. Faith and works, which is totally different from Christian salvation. Faith alone without any works involved. So that is very important. People who teach otherwise, you've got to avoid those people. If they, in, if they deny such an ingrained main doctrinal truth that is throughout the entire book of Revelation, and not just that, throughout the entire Bible, we see so much of that mentioned as well, then you might as well reject the rest of their teaching or put them on a shelf. You can't really trust them 100%. Now, the thing is, is that if they're independent fundamental Baptists and they deny dispensational salvations, and my word, if there's no other church to go, you got no choice, right? But concerning about their Bible study teaching, that's something that you're going to have to put a filter and you're going to have to be very careful and not trust them 100%. So it's important to attend a Bible-believing church. And please email us and we can give reach out to you on that. And if you don't have one or we can't give you one, then that's why we're here for you online.